Our text for May 15th, Pentecost Sunday, is from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 14, verses 23 to 31. Now, in context, we see Jesus preparing his disciples for his eventful, or his eventual, rather, visible absence from their midst. We have the well-known words of Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, earlier, the first well, especially verse 2, I think we're pretty familiar with, where he speaks of going to the Father to prepare a place for his followers. And then in chapter 15, following this text immediately, he reminds them that they will always abide with him and he with them. Obviously, things are going to be changing. And the change involves a manner in which Christ is present with them. And the message appears to be that as much as things will change, they will remain the same. Also note here in our text as we go through it, the oneness of Jesus with the Father. And how that unity points to a, a unity between Jesus also then and his followers. Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus and his followers are one. And then of course for Pentecost Sunday... Uh, preparation for the sending of the Holy Spirit, they are uh, quite a bit of information between these three kind of different things. Uh, it's a lot of threads to bring together, which is what we'll attempt to do here today as we go through, through our text. Now, Dr. William Weinrich, in an excursus from his John commentary, in his volume one, argues that baptism is the central theme in John's gospel. And the question before us today then as we delve into this text is just exactly how do we see that theme, this theme of baptism in this text? Or do we? Um, and Weinrich would write, he writes, The apostolic ministry in the life of every Christian begins, as did the public ministry of Jesus himself, with baptism and the reception of the Holy Spirit. So, as the apostles prepare uh, for Christ's departure and the beginning of the church's ministry, they await the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so the apostolic ministry, the church's ministry, might begin. Our text begins then, the verse before, verse 22, in response to the question in verse 22 of Judas, not Iscariot, but Judas, uh, he is known as Thaddeus as well, he asks, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? What's the difference? How or why are we set apart? So as we look at uh, verse 23, we look at ton legon mu. This is a reference now to the word, but the entire word of Jesus, the, um, if you will, the entire gospel message as compared to verses 15 earlier and even verse 21 where you get the, uh, the language of tos entelos, tos emos, uh, which is more specific, the commands. Whoever, if one would follow Jesus or uh, keep his commandments, the word of Jesus, uh, it's a... It's very important as we go through here, as you look at the text, because I think this is where we, a lot of people get off the track onto a bunny trail, which causes a lot of trouble. But it's very important not to confuse the order and the point. Keeping the word of Jesus does not make you lovable to him. Keeping the word of Jesus identifies you as one whom Jesus has first loved. Now this statement that Jesus makes is in response to Judas, not Iscariot's question. Faith in Christ is an assumed reality, and so Christ manifests himself to the faithful, those who love him, and they show it by keeping his word. Now we look over here at a loyal Sometha and uh, also poisometha, these two that we see in the, um, in the um, 
future middle forms. We will come. We will make, Jesus referring to him and his father, and then making their dwelling, their, their abode here with the Monet up here. We will make our dwelling with you. But then as we go to verse 24, we're going to see the contrast of verse 23. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Again, not keeping the words identifies you, identifies you as an unbeliever. And so Christ will not manifest himself to you. Now some would argue that this logos, the uh, plural form here in verse, 20, verse 24, uh, should be translated as sayings, um, being as a, a, a part of the logos. The logos is just is a plural, sayings, as like in um, commandments perhaps, but only as one part of the word. And the plural form, of course, leads to that understanding. We also see here then the... Uh, The one who sent me, you know, Jesus referring to the Father here, the Patros, he is sent by the Father. Uh, this is an aorist participle, the one doing the sending, the Father, the sending one here. And uh, once again we see Jesus emphasizing his inseparable, inseparable connection with the Father. Notice as you go through this chapter, chapter 14, we see him talking about his connection to the Father, you know, bringing up the Father in verse 2, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 16, 21, 20, 23. That's quite a bit for one chapter. So that connection, keep your eyes on that. Then verse 25, moving on, we'll see this... Uh, Lolach leka. This is from la, <clears throat> the verb from the verb la leo to speak, perfect form. These things I have spoken to you, and will continue to speak to you while I am still with you. Now, as we go to verse twenty-six. We're going to see uh, four different phrases here. They all are um, statements that help to properly identify the one who is coming. So we begin with the Oda Parakletos, the Paraclete, the Helper. Then uh, we get the uh, Holy Spirit, the Poema Tohagion, as another example. Oh, and then we have the whole pemse, ho pater, the, the, the father, the one the father has sent. And very important to our discussion here, the one sent in my name, the onomati, onomati mu, in the name of Jesus. All four of these uh, phrases help to... Um, point to who is this one who will be sent, uh, how he will be sent, those sort of things. So as we look here uh, at this first, uh, the paracletos, oftentimes we translate it as paraclete or helper. Sometimes we get the language of counselor or comforter. Uh, John's the only, only one to ever use this term. He uses it here in the gospel, but he also uses it uses it in his first epistle as well. Uh, the idea, originally anyway, at least as far as I can tell, is one who is called to another side to aid him, similar to an advocate, an advocate in a court of law. Now later in the Greek language, we see this, uh, it uses this term as an act of counseling or, or of consolation. Therefore, you come up with the, the word counselor or comforter. Jesus is our advocate with the Father, as we also see in 1 John. But so is the Holy Spirit, as we read here and then also in Romans 
chapter 8, verse 26. But I want to focus here for a moment um, and point you to this. It's going to come up again in verse 27. But this, in the name, in the name of Jesus, or in my name, as Jesus says, the unamatamu, the the connection to the name of Jesus is of great importance here, especially when we get to verse 27. We also see the first occurrence of that then taking place in 14, chapter 14, verse 13, which precedes this text, of course. But let's finish up here with verse 26 before we move on to 27. We have the didaske and the hupomenese. These are um, future tenses, meaning... Uh, will teach and will cause to remember, or maybe even uh, will bring to remembrance, maybe is another way to say that. Um, all that Jesus Christ has been teaching them, coupled with the events that would soon take place, would require then the Holy Spirit to connect all of these dots. There's going to be a lot of confusion and so they're going to need to be reminded of what Jesus said and what Jesus taught. Now, as we look at verse 27 then, to move right along, we have the Irene, the peace. Right here. Oops. The Irene, the peace. Uh, a standard greeting, first of all, a standard greeting both in arriving and departing uh, when in this ancient time. So peace as you come, peace as you go. And we'll, we've seen Jesus use this term, or we'll see him use it again after his, uh, well, certainly in our, our text earlier on, on Thomas, you know, our, the doubting Thomas text uh, where Jesus says peace as he enters into the room, fear not, that kind of stuff. This is typical. However, I think it's important here now to pay attention that the apostles could not have missed this significant connection here with unamatamu, in my name, and arene, peace. You know, this is, connects them directly, directly to the Aaronic blessing in Numbers chapter 6, 22 to 27. The priests pronounce the blessing which gives peace and places the name of the Lord upon the people. That's verse 27, which follows that ironic blessing. Remember, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Thus shall the priest put my name on the people. So peace and the name of the Lord are, are put together here. Very important. Uh, first of all, the ironic blessing, as, we, as I just gave it to you, is in a Trinitarian form. Important here as we see the three persons of the Godhead uh, in the John passages we're doing here in chapter 14 being referenced in connection with one another, being connected together. And the idea is only those who bear the name of the Lord have peace. Listen again. Only those who bear the name of the Lord. Think baptism here. Only those who bear the name of the Lord have this peace. And so I don't think that the uh, disciples, the apostles, would have missed that very important connection. Now as we continue on, note again, Jesus distinguishes between the peace of his followers, you know, the peace that basically that he gives, and then the peace, and when I say peace, I mean no peace, but the peace of the world that the world cannot give. And all this, this idea that um, oh, the peace of the world obviously is not a true peace, but only being connected to the name of Jesus, being uh, in baptism. You know, peace comes from being a follower, being a believer. So, um, we continue looking on here, we get the, uh, this do not be troubled, do not be afraid, 
the uh, deal, if I find it up there, the city. Ah, yes. Do not be troubled. Do not be. Do not be troubled. Do not be afraid. The, the may here, the negation. The um, the peace of, of Christ, the peace of the Lord, of course, allays all these kind of troubles and these fears. But if you think about uh, what Jesus is talking about, I mean, it's going to get tough. If you consider the context, you know, as we have been through the Easter, uh, Lenten season, then Easter, but now we, we prepare to go into Pentecost. Because we're in the gospel, you know, we, we don't, we're out of, out of order in a sense. And so you have to remember that Jesus is talking to them, reminding them or showing them or preparing them. There's some very difficult and troubling times coming up. Very difficult that lie ahead. And certainly in the eyes of the world, extremely difficult. But Jesus reminds them of the reality of his peace, which is theirs. Okay, now as we move to 28, we see this uh, aorist, the ekusata, you know, to hear, or in this case uh, with the aorist, you heard. And then this, this phrase, which is, is kind of interesting here, Ego aipan himen hipago kai erkomai pros himos. I am going away and I will come to you. Now that seems peculiar, doesn't it? I am going away and I will come to you. It would be a very concerning, not to mention confusing statement here. If Jesus hadn't previously said or told them where he was going, he told them in verse 2, chapter 14, verse 2, I'm going to the Father. And then he tells them what he's going to be doing there, preparing a place. And that he would come again to take them to be with himself. This is chapter 14, verses 2 and 3 again. So because of this earlier, his earlier statements and earlier explanations, Jesus is more reasonable to state, if you loved me, you would rejoice. In other words, I'm going and I will come again. And if you loved me, you rejoice in that fact. That would seem unreasonable if Jesus hadn't already set that up earlier in, in the chapter, at the very beginning, actually. Okay, moving on to verse 29. We have the... Areka, the perfect form, that perfect form of, uh, oh, the perfect form of ego, or lego, rather, excuse me, I have told. And then um, this little particle here, the prin, now used with this infinitive, genesthai, it gives you that, uh, that sense of time. So I would probably... Uh, Translated as before in, in a temporal sense. So you get that um, expression of time with the uh, infinitive there. It's an aorist middle infinitive. And then we have the uh, genetai and the uh, pistoiate, which are both um, aorist middle subjunctives as well. Aorist middle subjunctive, aorist middle subjunctive. So you get some very interesting phrases here. But what we have going on is Jesus is now revealing the purpose for the whole discourse. And that's what I think we need to contemplate here. The whole purpose of this whole discourse is so that when all these things take place, you may believe. Okay, so now we'll go on then to verse 30. We have the laleso, that future, meaning to speak. And in this thing with the neg negation, I will no longer speak. And then tu kosmu arkon. Right here. Tu kosmu arkon. When the ruler or the prince, sometimes we translate as prince of the world, 
uh, when the prince of the world comes, this um, reference really is to Satan. Some people have referenced this to Judas, but it's really a, a bigger reference than that. It's a reference to Satan and the forces that he has marshaled to destroy Jesus, which happens to include Judas Iscariot in chapter 18 coming up. But these forces have no power over him because, and Jesus himself says this to Pontius Pilate, as you remember, but Jesus delivers himself up to death. He lays down his life. It's not taken from him. He lays it down. He delivers himself up to death. It's not the ruler of the world, the prince of the world, who has this power. And then in verse 31, to bring to completion the chapter in our text for today, Gano, our eris subjunctive there, and anate lato, eris middle, and the entelo, meaning to command. Jesus then, to say this one more time as he puts this together, Jesus subjects himself not to the will of the world or to the will of the ruler of the world. Rather, he subjects himself to the Father and to his will. And this action of Jesus then sends a message to the world as it tells us here in verse 31. And the message to the world is Jesus loves the Father. Now, Dr. William Weinrich mentions in his John commentary, the relationship of the Father and the Son is the structured backbone of the gospel story. So now, because this text is for Pentecost Sunday, I think a few remarks um, concerning Pentecost may help inform your preaching. Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, is one of three times that Israel is commanded to appear before God in the temple in Jerusalem. The others would be Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles. So here we have Pentecost or Feast of Weeks. And Pentecost was a time of making an offering, but they were called wave offerings. And they were made, these offerings were made from newly harvested wheat. And Pentecost then in Greek, of course, means 50, and it stands for it's a 50th day after the Passover Sabbath. And uh, you get all of the um, regulations and all the how to do it and all this in Leviticus chapter 23 in the Old Testament, uh, verses 15, 17, somewhere in there. It is, um, I think, very significant as you consider this idea, why... The question always is, why did Jesus choose such a time as Pentecost to, to um, send the Holy Spirit? Why is this done at that time? Obviously, there's a lot of people in Jerusalem because this is one of the required times. But it's that idea of the Feast of the Harvest is the time chosen for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that fascinates me. You see, because with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as we mentioned earlier, that this, this is how you always begin something, whether it be your baptism, you're baptized by water and the Spirit, and you begin your life as a child of God, or it's um, Jesus at His baptism, the Holy Spirit descends in the form of the dove, and He goes forth to begin His earthly ministry. Well, here, now we have this outpouring of the Holy Spirit again. And it is actually that which then, or at that time, is when the apostles are sent out into the harvest field. God bless you, and God bless your preaching.